Cheers, guys. Epix911, welcome to a miscellaneous VR episode, uh, a series that I basically haven't done a video for, wow, probably since, I'm guessing the summer. It's been a hell of a long time, and the reason I'm doing one now is there's pretty much no VR news today. It's Christmas Eve. Anyone who's anyone in VR is probably at home playing or spending time with their family. They're not writing about VR. And that seems to be across the board. I'm hoping things are back to normal on actual Christmas Day, but I suspect it'll kind of be like today, another slow day. The good news with that is I can tackle stuff from the to-do list, the quote-unquote list where you guys have asked me stuff. Uh, there's some oft-requested old stuff on that list, including this one. So the video we're going to do today basically has to do with Entry-level VR versus high-end, what you can expect. And I'm going to mix that in with a request for what I'm running, which I've mentioned before, but I'll put it all into one spot. And it should give you a good idea at the end of this video what the machines are capable of. I'm going to run benchmark tests using VR Mark, some real-world testing, and of course, talk about the specs. So let's start with my beast, the main one right here that you guys always see me filming in front of. This is PC number one. PC number two is, yeah, I was going to say arguably the second most powerful PC in the house, but it is. There's that one there, then daughter has one, and wife has one upstairs as well. They're all good gaming rigs, but they're not what I would call VR ready. So that is behind me VR ready entry level. And this is VR ready high end. So let's talk about the specs. Let's start with my main machine. Now, the motherboard that I went with is that one right there, the Asus ZZ170 Pro Gaming motherboard. I love this motherboard. There's a reason I love it. <laughs> if you have a look at that, guys, there are four USB 3.1. Uh, there's onboard sound, which is pretty decent, but more on that in a second. Just a mass bevy of features. And of course, it's 1151. That's the chipset, which supports the latest Skylake processors. Now, I don't have the box for that, but I've mentioned it before. I have an i5-6600K on this machine. The K just means that it's unlocked, and overclocking is not what it used to be. Back when you had a Pentium 75 and you could make that baby run at 120 or 133, that was an overclock. Or the Celeron 300As, basically doubling in speed, that was an overclock. This, or today, minuscule because it's mostly about the GPUs, where CPU is still part of the equation is if you're doing crazy stuff. SLI, massive multitasking. Hell yeah, get yourself an i7, benefit from additional cores. But for your average gamer, even though the i7 is a better CPU, you're going to get by just fine with a CPU like mine. With that said, it will be upgrading to an i7 probably within the next few months. But right now, i5 6600K Skylake processor. I'm running that with a pretty, I wasn't going to say um, aggressive, but a very conservative overclock. I'm overclocking basically 400 to 500 megahertz, which is nothing. However, there's a couple things you got to weigh. The first is, like I told you, CPU overclocking, not near as important as it once was. But if you're going to go ahead and do it, whatever you do, try not to use the stock fan. The OEM is just not well suited for even modest overclocking. It'll do it, and nine times out of ten, you're probably going to be successful. But if you have issues, it's really hard to troubleshoot. The most reliable thing is, you know, running Prime and, and just running some of these stress tests that are dozens of hours. But if you can control the variables, control the variables, and that's one way to start doing that. 
is by not using the OEM heatsink and fan that comes with it, uh, unless it's the unlocked where it won't come with one. Now, with that said, that's what I use for that very, very modest overclock. Is it a great cooling fan? Hell no. Is it better than the OEM? Hell yes, and that's why I use it. You would want a much better, beefier, more effective one if you were doing actual aggressive overclocking, which I am not. And that is from Cooler Master, the Hyper 212. Now, power supply. Again, when you're troubleshooting stuff, power supplies are tricky, tricky beasts to eliminate, rule out, not have be part of the equation. So what I chose to do with my main gaming rig, because I, back when I purchased it, I thought I might do SLI at some point. I went with a beefy power supply. And for a lot of people, this is going to be overkill. I totally understand. But for me, it's peace of freaking mind. And that is this beast here of burden, the EVGA gold rated 1300 G2. And if your guess is, wow, does that mean that's a 1300 watt power supply? Yeah, that's exactly what it means. Like I said, overkill. But I can almost guarantee you when I have any kind of issues, this isn't the prime suspect ever. And from that point of view, it does exactly what I wanted it to do. Now, the next controversial area we're going to say is with regards to sound. There was a time when Sound Blaster, AdLib, these cards, Gravis, they ruled the roost because A, there was no onboard sound. It was PC speaker, which was leagues and lifetimes of horrible. And I should just play some of those for you. You could use it as water torture. That's how bad it was. And yes, I finished several games with PC speaker sound back in the day. Not fun. All right. However... Onboard audio has come a long ways since the dark ages of early PC DOS VGA gaming. So far, in fact, it's pretty much killed off the sound card industry. There's not a hell of a lot of options out there. But with that said, can you still get benefit from a third-party sound card? Hell yes. And that's where I think a lot of people make a mistake is they will save because of that onboard audio to, you know, sounding as good the hundred something dollars when they could have much better with even just something like this. This is the Sound Blaster Z or Z. And I love this card. What's good about it and what used to be a big issue in the beginning, not so much anymore, is onboard sound would actually dr uh, drag your frame rate down. You would have frame rate drops of 10 to 20 percent by using onboard. That's tightened up considerably. But if you want, again, ultimate peace of mind, like with the power supply, that's what you go with as a starting point. There's much better. Okay. Video card wise, most of you know this, I've got the EVGA 1080 GTX Founders Edition. That's what's running in this beast. You would think I'm probably okay with USB cards, but you'd be wrong because I have both of these in my system. I've got the Inatech because my Vive was not compatible with the 3.1 that I, you know, that the Asus has. The, I forget what the chipset is. But it has issues. It works sometimes, doesn't work, blah, blah, blah. Inatech, 100% reliable. Purchased it based on recommendations. That gave me an additional uh, four USB ports. And then I've got this Vantech one, which is USB 3.1 Gen 2. Gave me another two. So I've got 10 3.0 slash 3.1 USB ports. And yes, I still on occasion run out of USB and mostly it's because I'm an idiot and haven't been running my printer wirelessly when it has that ability I have it plugged in so that's usually the sacrificial lamb that I swap in and out but I will set up the wireless and just make that a moot point that's the main PC let's talk about the one behind me there and I don't need to move there to talk about it written everything down 
processor wise they're almost identical and i did that for a reason guys i did that because when i do benchmarks i want to be able to illustrate look what a difference the gpu makes because all things else are equal it's an asus z170 motherboard that i have in there the same 16 gigs of ram i've got the exact same cpu in there Basically, everything is identical. For benchmarking, it just it really illustrates and drives home the difference you can get just based on the GPU, which was kind of the main point of this video that you guys have requested. So the main difference is, video card-wise, R9-290. It's an AMD card in there, and that's good. I like to usually have one of each, an NVIDIA and an AMD. It doesn't allow you to do as much apples to apples comparisons, but it's still, you represent both and you can evaluate things that are specific to one and not the other, right? Like they've, one has the liquid VR, for example, the other one, et cetera. They've got their own proprietary solutions for virtual reality. So those are the systems. Then there's benchmark. So when I catch you guys on the flip side of this video, we're going to look at exactly that. Benchmarks on this one using VR Mark, then benchmarks on that one, which I'll post up. Let's see what VR Mark tells us about my system. So I mentioned in the first clip, kind of before this, how I'd set about building these things. That my intention was to have that one behind me be entry level VR and this one here be high end to premium. Let's see if VR Mark agrees with my assessment. So we're going to start with the AMD machine. We're going to run two benchmarks, Blue Room and Orange Room. We're going to do the same on this. We're going to compare. So let's start with Blue Room for the R9 290. We're going to open that, let it spin its magic, spit us out a result of 1,079. Now, what does that tell us? If you look at the chart here or the graph, the Oculus Rift minimum spec. So this is from Oculus directly themselves. They say 719 would be your bare minimum. The 3D Mark guys, they don't kind of prescribe to that. They say no. You know what? To have a VR ready PC, it should be this number. Rather than 719, this number for the Blue Room tests is 1,082. So you can see we are literally within three points. Could we tweak and get it higher? Absolutely. Do we need to? Hell no. The reason is we're close enough. We can see based on the Blue Room result that we are neck and neck with VR ready PC. We happen to be under by three points. We could have been over by three both completely acceptable, okay? The high end is 1,097, which we're close to as well. The premium is the real first big jump. That one is to 2,175 for a premium high end PC. So that is the blue room test. Let's take a look at the orange room for the R9 290. Check that out. 5,438. And if we look at the graph below, you can see the average frame rate, but more importantly, our score. So the VR ready PC was 5,000 and that's the one I said, consider that your bare minimum. High end 6706, premium 8290. So with the R9, I think we're comfortably almost in the middle, but closer to VR ready than we are high end for that machine with the R9 290. So that's good to know, 5438. Now what we're gonna do guys, is we are going to look at the big beast, Big Bertha here. And let's bring that up, so the 1080, same thing, we're gonna start with the Blue Room results. Holy crap, check that out guys, so our score, 2149 pasted the R9 290 as is to be expected. Look how close we come to usurping the premium high-end PC. 
2175, we're at 2149. We've doubled the high end PC. We are in very comfortable premium high end PC VR territory with that result. Absolutely. The VR ready PC 1082, the minimum we talked about 719. Very freaking cool. Let's look at the orange results now. So check out this number, guys. <laughs> wow. 7,712. Again, puts us neck in neck with the premium high-end PC. We're definitely above the high-end by about 1,000. And only 450, 550 away from the premium high-end. So whereas the R9 290, I would say, is neck and neck with the entry-level VR PC, our high end is in fact probably closer to the premium high end. So really both ex uh, extreme on the high end and not quite the extreme on the low end. We're more in that comfortable 3D mark entry level as opposed to the much more aggressive lower number of Oculus themselves. So very cool. Those are the benchmark guys. That gives you a rough idea, rough I say, because what I mentioned at the beginning is so bang on. Don't use these as gospel. If there were other programs available right now, I'd say use those first. Then use this. Plus play games and, you know, monitor the frame rates. The feeling you get when you're playing, the latency, the fluidity, all of that to see where you stand. Rather than just running one program. But at the end of the day, it gives us a very quick, open summary look of existing hardware. And for that, I got to say hats off to the 3D Labs guys, as usual, with just some good benchmarking tools. All right, guys, cheers as always, and definitely catch you guys on the VR flip side.